All right, welcome to another Thursday night meditation talk. See you guys here. Um, so, you know, different weeks, well, let's put it this way, coming up with a topic every week is not easy. So many times I just meditate on what I should talk about. And what came to mind is things I just keep seeing from patients and students, the kind of questions I get asked and uh, how can I best help you help yourself. And so on the one hand, I want to consider challenges. On the other hand, I want to give you the best tool to deal with really any of these challenges. And that is, if there was one, it would be the breath. If we come back to breathing, you know, how much can we control with breathing? Many times I'll have a patient and the root of their troubles, now from a Chinese perspective and actually a physical perspective, I can root it in the heart. But there's a lot of anxiety, insomnia, fatigue. It's, it's actually the heart. But part of that was caused, we'll say. I mean, we're born with issues too. So, because any age I can feel issues in the heart. But very few know how to breathe properly. Even the concept of a deep breath. What is a deep breath? Is it, is it big? Is it full as much as you can? Or is it deeper into the body? So you see, most people don't even know what a deep breath actually is. So with many patients, I will actually find their Dantian. They're laying on a table or, or chair and I will find their Dantian. And I will place a finger, put a little pressure there. And I'll say, breathe to my finger. And most people don't do very well right away. They're trying to push down and the, and the chest is expanding. And so it's very obvious right away, they don't know how to breathe. And so I work with them a little more. Then I said, make sure you're breathing in through the nose and down to my finger. My finger should actually move. You can press against it. And I actually put pressure so that it leaves a bit of a imprint that they can feel so that they can remember later. Many times they thank me in the future. Those who remember and practice, those who don't, in one ear out the other, right? I can't do anything about that. That's kind of the, the story of our lives. If we're learning good things, whatever that is, it could be about really anything. You get excited, you start telling others and they just don't get it. And maybe you get frustrated, maybe you get stressed. Or maybe you just don't bother and you keep things to yourself because in the past it wasn't worth sharing. But breathing is a really important thing I find to share. So whoever will listen, I want them to get it because it's something I've practiced for many, many years. It goes right along with meditation, of course. In fact, it's a, it's a good intro to meditation because it centers you. In fact, you can use the breath as a focal point. So what is one of the reasons, one of the benefits, one of the points of depth of breath with the Dantian actually moves? Breathing is involuntary, but it also can be voluntary. All day long you're breathing, but you don't think much of it. Maybe we should. Maybe a more conscious life is actually anytime, anywhere, checking the breath. How am I responding to such and such? Something scares me. What happens to the breath? 
when I'm stressed in general, how am I breathing? When I'm sitting down for a meal, how am I breathing? When I'm talking to someone that gets me upset, how am I breathing? How am I breathing when everything seems fine? In many cases, I can be near, sit near, just be within uh, you know proximity of, a, of another person. And it's very clear the level of uh, health. Why? Well, there are things I can observe, but many times I hear them breathing. And I shouldn't. A healthy person, you really don't hear them breathing. In fact, very few people realize When you meditate and you actually get some depth to your meditation, you know, actually meditating, not just the practice of meditation, but actually the depth of the meditation, the depth of the mind. You can look to someone observing you as if you're not breathing at all. Like they may have to actually check you. That's how relaxed you should become. couple reasons for that. One is thinking spends the most oxygen. Thinking, well, the brain cells, they've been measured at about 12 times the oxygen consumption of other cells in the body. So if the heart is not pumping optimally, as it's supposed to, the brain is right away the one that's going to suffer. If there's some trauma, some injury, something happens where you stop breathing, the fear is brain damage. And that's the reason. So take it a, a bit further. Well, it's how I feel, how I think, all the things I'm afraid of, all my emotions really come from my thinking. And the first thing to get damaged when there isn't enough breathing, could breathing then in effect, change everything about how you think and feel? And I'd say, absolutely. I've seen where it's been measured that breathing to the Dantian can expand the lung capacity, the lung, the vibe, the respiration, about five or six times. When we have the basic breathing class, teaching breathing, we talk about five lobes of the lungs, right? There's two on the, on the left where the heart sits and there's three on the right. And so we talk about just breathing to the top and it's like there's five cups, I'm only breathing to two. And so you do the math there and it seems, well, if I breathe to all five, it's about two and a half times more. But this isn't right, this isn't true. Most of the capacity for respiration is in the lower part of the lungs. When the diaphragm is loose and releases and the, and the, um, and the dantian, the belly, but really, the lower belly is able to move, your respiration increases a good five or six times. So now you think about how much more efficient and effective that is. You're already working with the heart, so the heart itself isn't working alone, right? Now, if we're breathing the other way, like the person I place the finger on the dantian and they and they breathe to the chest, they have a hard time right away. If they breathe to my to my finger and their and their chest starts going up, and it's very obvious that this is how they breathe all the time. And then I have to explain what's what's different. When we breathe this way, up shallow, chest moving in and out, you know, even as high as the clavicles moving. 
this is generally over breathing, struggling, stressful. It actually raises the stress. It actually makes all the all the muscular tissue, including the smooth muscular tissue that's within the vessels, makes it all contract, makes it all tense. Because oxygen activates, carbon dioxide relaxes. It's a very interesting thing to realize again in, in yang. Yang is active, yin is passive or receptive. The yin allows you to receive the yang. If you're so active in your breathing, too much yang, there's nothing to receive it. And so now you're more starved for oxygen. The body is more stressed and tense. The mind is hard to focus. It's going to also be more emotional. It's like, um, almost like a static electricity. It's not smooth. Just your, your thoughts go all over the place. And without having some concept of the other experience, you don't have any idea what to do about it. And this is why meditation is the most important thing we do. But breathing is a way to get to meditation. So you wonder, your challenges, your emotions, the things you worry about, all these things we try to control. In my experience, when you breathe properly, there comes a clarity. Clarity doesn't have to come from information. I've always been an avid reader and I like to understand things from many perspectives. See what people from all different perspectives say about a topic, for example. If I want to answer a question, I'll have a I would have like a book, the equivalent of a bookshelf of books about that topic from every angle, and then I would come up with my own conclusions based on that. You know, what's what's ultimately true and what's BS. Because I find you can you can see what's BS when the mind has more clarity. So there's a there's a thinking your way through problems. And then there's the other side, the letting go your way through problems. Meaning maybe it's not a problem at all. Maybe you're just making it a problem. Maybe your belief system is what's filling you with fear and controlling your life and every decision you make. Ultimately, what you're experiencing every day. Why you're filled with so much stress or not. I can't tell you how many people, um, well, let's say post-diagnosis, I feel the pulse and I can tell they're a very stressed person, very anxious person, very emotional and they don't realize it at all. And, and the thing is, even before we were conscious, you know, very, very young, so young we can't remember, things may have happened that created fear in us and it stayed with us. Our, our way of looking at this world, our perspective, our programming made us fearful. And so normal for that person is very stressful. Normal for that person is full of fear, anxiety, worry. They think that's normal. I used to say one of my least favorite or pet peeves, least favorite things or pet peeves was, well, that's just the way I am. When people have that answer to things, that's just the way I am. Well, that has a road and a destination. And if you don't like where it's taking you, you have no way off if you just accept it. But if you change the way you breathe, which can then change the way you think and feel, well, you may be able to get off that road without even working very hard. 
it may actually be ultimately a letting go. You know, let things continue on their own path without you having to step in or fearing what might happen if you just allow things to be. Breathing can help us develop more depth of mind, more meditative type mind in a more during our regular day to day life. So, so if we can normalize breathing down into the dantian, but mm, slower, easier, without struggle, it might, and I think it will, lead to less struggle in your life with anything, you'll start to really uh, realize what you can or can't do things about, what you, what you worry about that you can't control, what you fear that you, you can't control, might, might suddenly uh, dawn on you, these things you can't control. You can't control the world around you, you can't control people around you. And the more you're stressed about what people do or don't do, it's only hurting you. What are you willing to do to really feel better and enjoy life more? Whatever your situation. Obviously, a stressful situation is much more challenging. But then there's the perspective of the source, the creator, maybe yourself on the other side in a spiritual way, knows exactly what you need and what challenges you have to experience in order for you to grow. And if you just keep responding the same way, you're stuck. Stuck is a problem because everything in the universe is moving and changing. And if you're not, other than getting older, well, I don't think you're enjoying your life as much as you could. It really is an inner battle to determine what we experience in this life. And well, that can be somewhat controlled by how you breathe. If your breathing slows down, your body starts to relax and your mind starts to calm, what would your life be like? What would your experience be like? What kind of decisions might you be making? Would you be making less decisions out of fear and worry and more decisions out of maybe a, a drawing, something you're drawn to, more of a passion? Or maybe even, and this may seem contradictory, but I don't think so. Maybe even what's really best, meaning, meaning a job or occupation that actually is very good for you and your family, but um, not really a passion. <laughs> meaning you can recognize, you can have less struggle by doing a, a better occupation because of clarity. And then with that clarity and understanding comes acceptance, which goes back to the letting go and feeling better about it it can lead to gratitude because, you know, wow, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I have this situation now because I can take care of myself, my loved ones, my children, whatever that is. You know, it may not be like uh, what you always dreamed about. And yet, because you're at peace inside, I mean, you do a great job because you're appreciating it. Our inner perspective is everything and breathing can direct that. Breathing can change that. Breathing can change that in the moment of the struggle. Once you understand how powerful your breath is, you can adjust on, in, you know, on the spot. One of the things I trained myself with the breath to do was I recognized that, let's say you're startled. 
And the common breath when you're startled is, <gasps> do you agree? Yeah, I've tell an actor, this is what happened. <gasps> that feeling. So I consciously practiced. If I get startled, I drop the breath. Instead of that, I went the opposite. What's different? Because startled is shocking. It can freeze you. It can create the deer in headlights. Don't know what to do. But by dropping the breath, you center yourself. And the mind becomes clear and you'll be able to make a quicker decision in how to respond. What is it that's that startled me? You don't necessarily eliminate the startle, but you change the course of what comes next. That's how powerful the breath is. And over time, I began to notice it happened automatically. With practice, anything can become a reflex. Just like when I when I walk around, drive a car, ride a motorcycle, whatever, I'm always in wide angle vision. I'm always practicing wide angle vision. And I was very impressed with my daughter recently. It came up in conversation that she learned that in the Kung Fu and she also practices it all the time. Yeah, just today riding on the, on the motorcycle, um, I used to make the joke, you can see the squirrel joking, I mean, joking. You can see the squirrel thinking about crossing the road rather than it suddenly being in front of you and you and you slam on the brakes or swerve out of the way. And it happened today on the way here. <laughs> so the squirrel coming down the telephone pole and it was with my peripheral vision. So I took a look at the squirrel and what do you know? He dropped and came right across in front of me, but I was more prepared to slow down and avoid him without it being this, this shock and, and oh my God moment. There was no oh my God moment because I watched him come down and cross the street. And then of course, as I rode by, I'm thinking, what are the odds? I mean, there's nobody on the road. I was on a road where there were no cars, there was nothing else. And this squirrel has to come down the pole and cross the road at the moment I'm, I'm going by. What is that? Maybe it only happened so that I could tell you the story tonight. <laughs> but that was one of the things I noticed early on practicing wide angle vision. It's, it's like you can see things happen. You can see things are going to happen before they happen. It gives you time to respond better. You know, it's sort of like being in a conversation and you're so intent, and this is my character, you're so intent to press your perspective that you don't really listen or pay attention to how the other person is responding. So that is a challenge I've always had to overcome. And so forcing myself to, to pay attention to their response, like, should I continue explaining? Are they not listening? Are they getting angry? Are they getting upset? So then I learned when to shut up. Because I'm a big believer in, um, how's that saying go? A person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. So why, why allow myself to get upset <coughs> if I can't uh, convince them? They have to be asking questions. They have to be interested. They have to want to learn. And a lot of people just want to continue this the status quo in their life. They don't want to deal with things. They don't want to learn. They don't want to listen. And frankly, whatever the news says they believe, no matter how much propaganda is presented, they just believe it. But I think people that are a little more clarity can see the truth there. And so they're not affected by it. It goes in so many ways in our modern world. You know, the, the more centered Mind, as well as informed, is less easy to be tricked. So one of the things came up for tonight was to handle people's, not handle, um, 
discuss people's challenges. But then that's what came to me. What other, whatever challenge you have, learn to use your breathing to better deal with it. Learn to use your breathing to center yourself and become create a more meditative mind so that you're coming from more of a, a center, a grounding. You're more grounded to deal with the situation rather than emotional and knee-jerk reaction. Sleep on it, right? It's the same. You don't have to physically sleep on it overnight. You can sleep on it by basically letting it go in the moment and allowing your yourself to sort of digest the situation. And then you have a better chance of making a better decision that's that may be just more practical, more helpful, and, and less stressful. So for the rest of the time, I want to open the floor, open up uh, for questions related to this. Um, challenges maybe you have or, or someone else, maybe even someone you know has, a loved one. So open for questions. So let me show you, see your hands. Yes, sir. Unmute. Okay, Mr. Antomate, yes, sir. My question is pertaining to my personal breathing experience at this time, um, especially during, seems to be during spring and summer months. I suffer from, uh, I guess, seasonal allergies. And uh, my breathing through my nose becomes a little bit more hampered. And um, I find difficulty in uh, achieving uh, just an easy breath through my nose. And I was wondering if you had any advice on how to restore that. I do. So in Chinese medicine, allergies tend to come from the liver. The liver is overactive. If the liver is overactive, you're hyper reactive to environmental toxins, chemicals, or just you know your standard hay fever. So the what I would treat if I was treating you with herbs would be things to calm the liver. But what else can you do to calm the liver? Well, liver brings up a lot of emotions. Someone whose liver is, we'll say stagnant, could even be an actual fatty liver. Liver is a filter to the body. So when the liver is uh, backed up, you might feel frustrated, irritable. You could even get angry. I don't know if you're drinking a lot or taking any chemicals, but all these things have to filter through the liver. And so the liver may be, may be uh, having issues. So I happen to have a lot of experience with what you're saying. I grew up with terrible allergies. I used to have to um, sleep like sitting up, I couldn't breathe at all. Um, a vaporizer was put on, which is like uh, a humidifier, putting moisture into the air. And my mother would always put this Vicks vapor rub on my chest to help, you know, whatever she could do to help. And, and again, I was sitting up with lots of pillows and things. I couldn't breathe. I was all blocked. Whatever the cause, I don't need to go into now. Um, but I have my, I can you know, make guesses, but whatever. Um, when I cleaned up my diet in my 20s, it started to change. I started to become less reactive to things. So one thing I'll say, to my, I'll say about myself is when I make a decision to do something, I'm 110%. You know, it's just, that's what I do. Um, in fact, there was a there was a diet that people the average the mainstream would say is the perfect diet that that actually was was uh, killing me <laughs> our bodies need fat we're told that polyunsaturated fats are good and saturated fat is bad and nothing could be further from the truth it's the exact opposite but i believe that 
and I would eat nothing but organic vegetables chopped up fresh every day and uh, all the whole grains and very little meat. And um, I was, um, I was extremely depleted and I was very young and at age 34, I was already aching all over thinking I'm getting old and my, my training was being affected. Prior to that diet, I was eating um, more of a standard American diet. And what happened there was I was training excessively, six to eight, nine hours a day with teaching, six hours training and two, three hours a night teaching. And I was just exhausted. So when I changed my diet to better food, more, more natural food, Instantly, I, I was also getting headaches too. I was getting headaches because of training so hard. My body was so shot. So when I initially went from what's more standard diet to this healthier diet, I was instantly had more energy to train. So already I could tell the difference, but the problem was this wasn't balanced properly. So low fat, especially back then, was the mainstream and then whole grains was the mainstream. And I mixed, I mixed everything. I didn't even one thing all the time. I mixed it. Quinoa, amaranth, brown rice, basmati, all the different long grain, short grain. I kept mix. I had such a variety of things. I did it perfectly. Lots of different color vegetables, everything, all fresh, all organic, and I was falling apart. So my training got better because I wasn't eating all the crap. Okay. My allergies got better for the same reason. Also, I gave up dairy. Pasteurized dairy is not good for us. It's another aggravating factor for allergies. So this went on for about nine years. At age 34, I discovered some other things when I started studying native peoples. I studied native peoples and I actually went to start training in uh, survival skills of native Americans and all that kind of stuff. And it all kind of pulled together for me. And literally um, from age 34 to 35, I put on 30 pounds of muscle without ever touching a, a resistance, you know, without ever touching weights. So I realized my body was in somewhat of a starvation. It was like being on a deserted island and not having enough food. It's, and I would eat two plates at every meal. I ate like a horse, and yet I was completely depleted. Why? Not enough uh, especially saturated fat and not enough proper protein. And I'm not gonna speak for everybody on the planet, but this is true for my body. And I, and I will tell you straight out, we are hunter gatherers. So anybody wants to argue with that, you know, good luck. This is why I don't wanna convince you have to actually experiment for yourself, get out of your head and understand natural laws. So that's why everything I do is really based on natural laws. So my diet was cleaner, but I was falling apart. So from 34 to 35, I put on 30 pounds of muscle, stayed the same for many years. And literally 10, 15 years later, still felt, I felt much better than I did at 34. 34 is young. Okay. So that was one experience. Then since 34, I've been on the same diet and it's been, it's been phenomenal. I mean, I'm, 55 in a few days, and I'm like I was 35. I, mean, I feel better than I did at 34. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's 55. It's still an age, but I'm able to do just about everything the same. I don't, like the clarity, the energy, everything's there. And I completely attribute that to diet because when you're eating things that your body's not supposed to have and the liver starts to get backed up, you're going to also feel sluggish. Like you don't have to have any weight problem and you're obviously thin. So it's not a weight problem, but you can feel heavy. It's because your blood flow is not clear. It's actually sluggish. So you feel heavy, you feel sluggish. And that's another reason why people get irritable, um, angry, depending on the condition exactly. I have no idea exactly your condition, but also you can be, you can be, some people become, you know, it affects different people differently, but some people have allergic problems. They start becoming uh, hyper reactive to things in the environment. So one side of the equation, the other side of the equation was 
I was always, I can remember all the way back to grade school, sniffing because I couldn't breathe. So I always had this stuff science that I always felt like there was some, some drip happening and I had a, I had a sniff. I honestly think I must've drove people crazy while I was constantly sniffing all the time. And there have been times when I was in my 20s when people thought I was doing cocaine. <laughs> like, where are you getting that stuff? <laughs> what stuff? I figure if you're sniffing all the time, there must be a reason. But my second teacher had a student, it was a senior student. And he sat me down one time and he explained to me about it. It was very interesting. It only took me 10 years to apply it. So just saying, <laughs> it takes you a while to take this advice. He said, stop sniffing, first of all. You have to discipline yourself not to sniff because it's just creating all this tension and it's making it worse. He said, let it run. Just let it go and don't blow your nose either. Just, you know, just wipe it the excess, and that's it. And you, and you make it a habit to completely relax the sinus cavity. And by the way, breathing helps that. It goes together. What starts to happen is, remember before I was saying how that breathing in the upper chest, also mouth breathing. I was naturally a mouth breather and I see it in my children. I try to help them, but it's hard to change. I was determined though. Once I made my decision to apply the guy's advice, I was determined. And one of the causes to all this um, extra mucus is mouth breathing. Because mouth breathing throws off the yin and yang of the breath the oxygen and carbon dioxide, it makes things too active and your brain is actually trying to block your breathing cavities to slow it down. It's trying to balance things by creating a obstruction. Isn't that so interesting how brilliant our bodies actually are? And so I forced myself to to use my nose, I would work out and I would just cl clamp my mouth closed and breathe through my nose no matter what. And over time, it came. My breathing today is a hundred times better than it was when I was young. And, uh, and this is actually a natural progression, I could say for martial arts in general, and especially in Bagua, because well, internal styles like Bagua, Taiji, Xingyi, these things, Breathing is an essential component with, with uh, the controlling the power and, and chi ultimately, how your body functions properly. So you, so you can use your, all your forces and not be holding yourself back. You're working against yourself. So clearing the liver, allowing this learning to relax, you do have to clear the diet. Pasteurized dairy is creating more mucus. Learning to breathe through the nose, not the mouth. Eventually what happens is you'll have less and less mucus. And I also can't tell you how many people I've met who say, well, I can't breathe through my nose. The doctor told me I have such and such, deviated septum, whatever, all these reasons, right? Yeah, I had that all that too. It's, it just wasn't true. Everything I learned over many years, this is a lifetime. Isn't it? I was probably late 30s by the time I, I mastered that. And I don't even know if I could say master. It probably even took longer to master, but I, I had it down enough where I was consciously practicing it. Eventually it becomes unconscious, right? It becomes automatic. But something that I probably learned around I don't know, 23, 24, it took me at least 10 years to apply it. And then probably another five years to get it down, 15 or more years to answer that question with experience. It's funny how we are, but I was only, I was grateful of one thing. I always remembered he taught me it. And when it came, when I finally made the decision, I got to do this, at least I remembered he taught me it. So that was good. 
So somewhere in there, sir, somewhere in there, I think is the answer to your question. Now, if you want to elaborate at all, if that if you don't think it applies, I'm open to hear you. Oh, thank you so much, Sifu. That was very helpful. Thank you. So somewhere in there makes sense? Uh, yeah, all of it helps. Everything. Okay, very good. That's awesome. All right. Now, where'd I go? There I am. Okay, uh, another question. Yes, sir. Mr. Thomas, the good doctor. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, my uh, daughter is a, is a vocal student and uh, they tell her to not drink any, any milk, no dairy products, because it creates so much mucus that it, it, it affects their vocal cords and, and, uh, and her singing. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say as far as breathing, when you're out in public, I always uh, am able to see someone who's going to be a problem, even if they're sitting there quietly, calmly, and you look at their respiratory rate and you're like, oh, wow, I better get away from this person. He's breathing like at a rate of 30. Something's going on with him. He can get away. So, so I, I find the breathing really helps with that. Very good. Yes, sir. Yeah. You're, you're making me have to talk about milk, though, because now I'm going to surprise you. It's going to sound so contradictory, but I drink a lot of milk. Well, milk, cream, dairy. Why is that? Because all the bad things about milk is the source and the pasteurization. So for over tw after those 10 years of giving up dairy, I learned about raw milk. And raw milk didn't create any of the same problem. I didn't have any mucus problem whatsoever. And it was very funny. My training partner from Romania, Sifu Ionescu, like a brother to me, he was one because he knew I was the I was the health fanatic, I was a researcher. And when I came back and told him that about raw milk, he was celebrating. He was so happy because he too learned how bad milk was for him. And when when he heard, I thought it was good a certain way, if you can get it raw, it changed everything for him too. And then he and I both for decades have been on a raw, more of a raw food diet. And, and we get raw milk from a, from a farm with our pasture raised. We get grass-fed butter and milk and cream and eggs that are from chickens that roam the, the farm and eat bugs and, and worms and everything and they're not fed any kind of soy and I mean that that is such a strengthening diet that is phenomenal but I, I did have to make that point so my basic rules of nutrition I'll just say it now before we finish and that is number one eat real food real food is one ingredient like an egg real food you know a steak is real food even ham has five ingredients already and then think of the kind of uh, processed foods and bags and boxes that we get with a, with a paragraph of ingredients that you couldn't even pronounce. You don't know what those things are doing to your body. So one ingredient is real food and then you add the ingredients. That's what a chef does. That's what a cook, you know, you learn a recipe and you add spices and things, but it's all natural stuff. You know what's in your food. Another one, basically avoid or eliminate grains. Grains are, are inflammatory. They cause a lot of the problems we have. When I had that diet, I was, a, I was eating a lot of whole grains. And uh, it's not just whole, all grains. It's not just gluten. It's things like gluten that are glue-like, sticky in the body. And it's just too many carbohydrates in the system when you eat that way. So, I mean, honestly, grains, beans, and legumes, these are fillers but we don't get a lot of nutrients from them. No matter how many nutrients they find in them, we don't absorb them. And I was eating back then two big plates, adult-sized plates at every meal. I was eating in abundance. And I was, well, I mean, the fat comp composition was like ripped. You know, you see the abs and everything, but also I was sunk here and my eyes were black here. So I was eating in abundance. You would think I would have all the nutrients I need, but I was clearly lacking in serious nutrients. So there's that. Uh, another one is vegetable oils. So rule number three is basically avoid or eliminate vegetable oils. They are unstable. They, they oxidize and they create all the problems that, you, that people think about cholesterol and all those things. 
so the canola is basically toxic for the body. Um, what do you call that? Um, all the polyunsaturates. Uh, well, corn and soy is, is virtually 90% ge genetically modified. So you don't want to have that. Corn, soy, uh, safflower, all the things that people think, are, a lot of people think are healthy, they are not healthy. Light and heat and um, light and heat and what? Oxygen, air will oxidize it. So it becomes poison very quickly. It's very unstable. You have the exact opposite with saturated fat. It's very stable. So a lot of people came up with margarine, for example. Margarine is that, I can't believe it's not butter, for example, that concept, right? You could put that out in the shelf and the bugs won't even touch it. The natural world knows that that is not food. So we trick ourselves thinking, oh, let's avoid all this cholesterol and saturated fat and have fake butter. It's done so much harm. Fourth one would be to avoid pasteurized dairy. That's why I brought it up. The rules are different if it's raw though. Raw dairy is actually healthy for us. It's been a food for thousands of years. Cow's milk, goat's milk. There is a difference too, by the way. Cow's milk in, a very, in our society is actually better than goat's milk. And the reason is it's more calming. Goat's milk, you know, think about a goat. They're very active. So that can actually make us a little more um, feel stress, a little nervous system irritation. And I'm going to tell you that firsthand. I learned it and it's true. You, you can tell. Goat's milk's good once in a while to mix it up, but it, it is definitely a different feeling whereas cow's milk is more calming. And I don't know if there's anybody who doesn't need a little more calming. So, and if you need a little more calming, you can even add that, um, drink the raw cow's cream. You know, they take the cream, heavy cream, pure cream. You drink that four ounces, eight ounces. It's like, it's like drinking ice cream, but it's natural, it's healthy, and it is calming. I have, I have given it to, to patients who either couldn't sleep or were under so much stress they couldn't deal with things. And they start drinking the, the pure cream, the raw cream that you get from an Amish farm or something. And they all agree, oh, it's so relaxing, so calming. So that's the more about dealing with stress. So that's it for tonight. Let's go to meditation.